Okay, so those are ionic compounds. Uh, now again, that's that's kind of how limited we are and how we draw them. Uh, we don't really draw Lewis diagrams for ionic, ionic compounds very much because it doesn't really show us too much, but uh, that's that's the best way we have to model it, which isn't saying very much. Uh, covalent compounds are more common uh, and something that we're asked to do uh, far more. Uh, and this is what happens now when electronegativities are close. Uh, so less than 1.5 means that it's covalent, which means it does what with its electrons? Yeah, if we share these free electrons, we'll both achieve noble gas configuration. Uh, so yeah, they share electrons uh, if that electronegativity is less than 1.5. So for example, chlorine. I have a compound here of Cl2. I have one chlorine, which is 3.2. And I have another chlorine, which is 3.2. Questions on how to subtract those, Jacob? Okay. What do you get? You get zero. The difference is zero. Therefore, covalent. So it's a covalent compound. The electronegativity difference is zero. So when I look at chlorine, Chlorine has how many valence electrons? Seven, right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I have another chlorine. I'll draw this in a different color because I can do that. This chlorine here also has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now they decide that, okay, the quickest way for us both to be happy is to share electrons. If we share electrons and form a bond, uh, then we can pretend that we have eight valence electrons, just like we were an ion. So they get together and they do that. This chlorine's like, yo, come a little bit closer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the other chlorine also, one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. So they share two electrons. And this is what we call a bond. So a chemical bond is when atoms share two electrons and it keeps them together. Uh, the nuclei attract that bond and it provides structure and rigidity. And we can put a whole bunch of those together uh, in a larger molecule. So they share those electrons, yes. Uh, yeah, so molecular compounds are sharing, yeah. Like are there weird metals that form molecules? Sometimes. Uh, it also depends sometimes on like how we model it because we also have a definition where ionic compounds are metals and nonmetals. But we also have a new definition of ionic compounds based off of electronegativity. Uh, and sometimes those work together. Sometimes they give us two different pictures. Because I can use electronegativities and I can have a metal and a nonmetal. If that difference between the metal and the nonmetal is 1.3, then it tells me I need to draw it like this. It's a covalent compound. So it... it there, it really gets down to whatever models we're using. We Sometimes we're limited by those models because uh, no model is perfect. Every model works for what it works for and doesn't work for what it doesn't work for. It's deep. Audrey? That was the whole point. Okay, uh, then we have O2. We have oxygen. We have two of these. Oxygen has six valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six. And here's oxygen's buddy, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now oxygen's like, hey, I want to reach noble gas configuration as well. 
let's share some electrons here, other oxygen. So they share one electron. We have one, two. We have, how many lone pairs does oxygen have? Two, yep, good. And how many bonding electrons? How many electrons are hanging out by themselves, ready to mingle? Two. So how many bonds do you think oxygen has to form? Two, and it does. So oxygen forms two bonds. There's this bond and there's that bond. So there are two bonds. We call that bond, double bond. Yeah. No, it's a molecule. Great question, which brings us to nitrogen. Nitrogen has how many bonding electrons? Three. How many lone pairs? One. So how many bonds do you think nitrogen needs to form? Yeah, so nitrogen forms what's called a triple bond, James Bond. So nitrogen forms a triple bond. Uh, and so Shane asked a great question about, oh, is it harder to break apart oxygen than it would be chlorine? And it is. Uh, nitrogen... Uh, Nitrogen, that triple bond, is actually super strong. There's 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. Our plants need nitrogen, but they can't access nitrogen in that triple bonded form. It took a Nazi war criminal named Fritz Haber uh, to come up with the Haber process, which breaks that triple bonded nitrogen and turns it into ammonia, which we can use in fertilizer, which is what they used to prolong the Nazi war effort. And they also, I think, used it to produce lots of explosives. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize for it. I think I told you this already, too. What? Well, Hiroshima was very different. That was like a hydrogen bomb, and that was the Americans dropping it, dropping it on the Japanese. What? Who? Yeah, sure. Is that different than a hydrogen bomb? Yeah, I think it was a hydrogen bomb, though. Maybe not. I don't know. You can Google it. It's Googleable. Um, so nitrogen forms a triple bond. And yes, it does give it a little bit more structure. Uh, but really, the, the ultimate goal is if we look at the bonding electrons, so the number of bonding electrons equals what's called the bonding capacity. Usually, if I have one bonding electron, I need to form one bond and then I'm happy. If I have two bonding electrons, I need to form two bonds and then I'm happy. And if I have three bonding electrons, I need to form three bonds and then I'm happy. Uh, so the bonding number of bonding electrons gives us the capacity, how many bonds that atom needs to form uh, in order to be happy. We'll go a step further now and look at methane. So this is CH4 or methane. It has carbon, which has four valence electrons, and four hydrogens. Now, when we look at molecules like this, the central atom... Where do you think the central atom goes? Hey, nice. So the central atom, in this case carbon, goes in the center. So the central atom is the one has the highest bonding capacity. So if we're trying to figure out, okay, which atom goes in the center, 
Uh, and usually chemists are great at helping us out. They put the things in order as they go together. Uh, but the central atom always has the highest bonding capacity. So here it's carbon. Now I need to attach four hydrogens there. How many bonds does carbon need to form? How many times, how many bonds does hydrogen need to form? Yeah. Now that is an exception, right? Because hydrogen is trying to look like helium, which is an exception. So hydrogen only needs to form one bond. And it, because helium's the closest noble gas, right? It's like, we're Canadians, so we're just, we're believers deep down. We're just trying to be like Justin Bieber. Uh, if we were, if we were British, maybe like I would be trying more to be like Nigel Horan or like one of the guys from One Direction. Uh, that might be more what I'm trying to be. So I'm always trying to be like whoever I'm closest to and feel like I can be more relevant. If I was British, or maybe Ed Sheeran, right? I'd be trying to be Ed Sheeran, or... Uh, yeah. Okay, so when I attach these H's... Uh, so hydrogen needs to form one bond here, another bond here, another bond here, and then another bond here. So here we have CH4 methane, where carbon is bonded four times, one, two, three, four. I look at carbon, and I'm like, is that carbon or is that a noble gas? Huh? What's going on here? Yeah. Because uh, I thought I wrote four. There. Four. So I look at it, I'm like, is that carbon or is it a noble gas? Because it looks like a noble gas. It has a full valent shell, but it is still just carbon. It has completed that noble gas ness -esque, uh, by bonding four times and sharing those electrons. Hydrogen looks now like helium. It has completed that by forming one bond. And so now everybody is happy, and they are sharing electrons in order to reach that happiness. Now, one thing we can do, and which we are going to do, uh, is we are going to go a step further. Drawing dots is annoying. It is nice to just be able to draw bonds as just like attachments. So the way that we draw structural diagrams is we show those bonds with dashes. Each of these bonds is two electrons. We do need to keep that in mind. So if I wanted to know how many valence, how many electrons were around the carbon, two, four, six, eight, each of those ticks counts as two. If I go back to the previous, exa previous example, I could draw chlorine like this. Much easier. I could draw oxygen like this. Much, we do. And I draw nitrogen like this. Because there's a triple bond, there are three bonds. Oxygen has a double bond, so there are two bonds. Chlorine has one bond, so there's one. No, those are bonds. Those are the attachments we drew here with dots. Each of those bonds represents two dots. And we can do that for methane as well. Each of those two dots can be drawn with a tick. And so in that way, we can draw molecules that are much bigger than methane, oxygen, chlorine, nitrogen uh, by showing that attachment. Yes. So that's called a structural formula. Now, one thing to keep in mind when we look at these structural formulas uh, and I'll just skip this but come back to it. Uh, when we look at these structural formulas, uh, uses a line, a pair of shared electrons, it does not show the lone pairs. So when we look at the structural formula, that's these. This is how we're going to draw most of the things that we draw. Every shared pair of electrons is represented as a tick. Now, the thing that is not drawn, though, are lone pairs. And that's important to note uh, because we are going to have to know that they're there later on. So it's a lot simpler 
It doesn't show us the lone pairs that are there, even though they are. Uh, and we have to remember that they are still there. Cool. So let's summarize. Ionic compounds. How are they different from molecular compounds? Give. So complete transfer. Electron transfer. Uh, what about molecular compounds? What do they do? Share electrons, right? How do I determine that with electronegativities? Yeah, greater than 1.5 difference in electronegativities. I don't want to write electronegativities, so I'm just going to write difference. To be molecular, it is less than 1.5 electronegativity difference. There's also some differences in how we draw them. We use square brackets to draw ions for ionic compounds. Metals are empty. Non-metals are completely full. For molecular compounds, we sh share electrons and we show that sharing of electrons with bonds. So molecular compounds look different than ionic compounds. Yeah. Great. I don't know. What? Well, it's more ionic than it is molecular. Like what example? Uh, again, it, it comes down to our model, like how do we want to draw it? Uh, if we're looking at that and then maybe we're like, well, it is a metal and a non-metal, I think most people would be like, oh, if it's a metal and a non-metal and the difference is right on 1.5, I'm going to draw it like it's ionic. Um, if it's like a couple of non-metals and the difference is 1.5, then someone's maybe going to be like, well, I'm going to draw it like it's a molecular compound. Uh, but either one's fine. If we're using just the model of electronegativity to define something as being ionic or molecular, there are going to be some weird situations compared to like our metal, non-metal thing that we were told to memorize in science 10. And which is fine because that's a good way to determine whether it's ionic or not. But our model really determines what the things are modeled as. Like if we choose a different model, sometimes things look a little bit different. Uh, how are they similar? What are they all trying to follow? Yeah, they're all trying to follow. We call it the octet rule. They're trying to completely empty or fill their outer shells. They want to look like noble gases. Uh, and in the process, they all look like the same. Yeah. Why? No. Why would you ask that and not just do it if you're determined to? Because obviously my answer is going to be no. But if you didn't ask, I would have walked around and you could have been like, I would have been like, Audric, why are all your notes in your data book? And like, I didn't know I couldn't do it. Right, you need to have a little bit more foresight when you ask these questions. Now you know you can't. It's like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. No. Yeah, it is. If you don't ask a question, the answer can be both right or not right. Yeah, well then it's decided one outcome or the other. Uh, so you have some diagrams. Try these. Um, so draw the... It says Lewis... But I, I think we're beyond that already. You can draw it in dots if you want, or draw the structural diagram, or kind of a hybrid of both where you show lone pairs and dots, but bonds and dashes. Uh, but try to draw these molecules, and then we'll check, make sure we're on the right track, and then move on from there.